Welcome to the final week of meeting the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about how the Spirit transforms and influences our lives. I wonder how it affects you when someone approaches you with an unloving or a negative spirit. Just think for a few moments about some Christians who display a loving, gracious attitude. Are you like them? In what ways is your attitude not like theirs? Well, I ask these questions because the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives does not display itself in what we do as much as in who we are. The evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life is a changed character. If you've been working through these sessions on meeting the Holy Spirit, if you've been building your relationship with him, if you've allowed him to fill you and you've begun listening for him speaking, if you've allowed him to renew areas of your life and if you've begun to feel him empower you and guide you, if you're beginning to live according to what the Spirit desires, then there will be a change in your character. I'm going to read today from Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 26, and I'm using the New Living Translation today. Galatians 5, verse 13 to 26. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, then watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Holy Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful desires, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension and division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their spiritual nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. As Christians, we've been set free in Christ. That freedom is limited by our obedience to Christ and by the needs of our brothers and sisters. Read again the expressions of the sinful nature outlined in verses 19 to 21. There's a dramatic difference in character and behavior between those people controlled by the sinful nature and those controlled by the Spirit of God. 
when do you personally sense the struggle between your sinful nature and the Spirit most strongly? Well, ask the Holy Spirit to show you the truth about this struggle and allow him to invade and inhabit that space. When Paul says anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God, it doesn't mean that Christians are incapable of these acts or that we cease to be Christians if we commit a sinful act. His point is that people who live a life marked by these things listed in verses 19 to 21 are giving evidence by that very lifestyle that they are not members of God's kingdom. If you were to walk into an orchard, you'd quickly discover what kind of trees were there by looking at the fruit that they produced. Well, you discover the true nature of a person by observing the spiritual fruit produced in his or her life. A person who claims to be indwelt by the Spirit will produce evidence by displaying a godly character. And Paul deliberately uses the singular fruit to emphasize that every aspect of the Spirit's character should be evident. Some aspects are more evident than others, but all of them should be present to some degree. Take some time to list the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit and think about how each quality can be demonstrated in your life. Which of these fruit are most lacking in your life right now? Our sinful nature was crucified in the sense that we no longer have to live under its control. And as Christians, we can choose to be obedient to the Spirit or to submit again to the old life's authority. We sin when we submit to the flesh, but we grow in godliness when we submit to the spirit. Everyone is controlled by something, and the Bible calls us to be controlled and transformed by the Spirit of God. I want to do a second reading today from Ephesians 5, verses 15 to 21, using the Good News translation. It says this, So be careful how you live. Don't live like ignorant people, but like wise people. Make good use of every opportunity you have, because these are evil days. Don't be fooled, but try to find out what the Lord wants you to do. Do not get drunk with wine, which will only ruin you. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with the words of psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing hymns and psalms to the Lord and praise in your heart. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, always give thanks for everything to God the Father and submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. Here, Paul uses the analogy of being drunk with wine or under the influence of alcohol. This phrase, to be filled, was often used in the New Testament to refer to control. And Paul uses it here because he's concerned about the misuse of anything that takes away our ability to submit to the Holy Spirit. We're not to be under the influence of alcohol, but to be influenced by the Holy Spirit. If you remember, back in session five, we talked about this being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a command that Paul gives us, be filled with the Spirit. If you can remember back to that session, we talked about the plerusa, the filling up to the top, continually making full, being filled with the new Marty, which is the breath or life of the Spirit. This is something that requires immediate, constant attention. 
being filled with the Spirit, constantly being filled up with the Holy Spirit, constantly under his influence. It's a conscious choice that we make. Remember the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So all the Holy Spirit's motives are pure and loving, and they bring glory to God. The influence he has on our lives will touch and affect all our relationships and show us a new way of respecting and loving one another. As the Holy Spirit influences you and transforms you, you should see a change in your relationship with God and in your relationship with one another. Our reading says, Speak God's word, sing psalms and hymns and give thanks and submit to one another. So how can you tell if you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, you can't really feel it, although some people do have a feeling at the time that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's not necessarily a matter of emotion, although again, some people find that they cry when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. But it really is a matter of obedience. When we're walking in obedience to God's word, when we're yielding ourselves to the Holy Spirit, when we can see the evidence of the fruit that we talked about, then we can be confident that we are being filled with the Holy Spirit. As you think back over the eight studies that we've done together, I wonder what aspect of the Holy Spirit's ministry has been most challenging for you personally and which has been the most encouraging. The Bible's teaching on the Holy Spirit is quite extensive and in our eight sessions we've really only been able to do an introduction and that's why we called it Meet the Holy Spirit. But I want to leave you with a question. How will you live, think, and act differently as a result of meeting the Holy Spirit. Let's pray to finish our session. I want to thank you, Jesus, for introducing us to the Holy Spirit. And I want to thank you, Holy Spirit, that as we yield to you, you fill us and invade us bringing strength and wisdom. I want to thank you, Holy Spirit, that you speak to us. I want to thank you that you renew us. I want to thank you, Jesus, for introducing us to the Holy Spirit. I want to thank you, Holy Spirit, that as we yield to you, you fill us and invade us, bringing strength and wisdom. I want to thank you, Holy Spirit, that you speak to us. I want to thank you that you renew us. I want to thank you, Holy Spirit, for empowering us to do God's work every day. And I want to thank you for guiding us, for liberating us in all those areas that we've opened up to you. Thank you for the gifts of the Spirit that you give us to equip us as a body. Thank you that you transform the areas of our lives and characters as we spend time with you. Thank you that you influence our lives and our choices for good and to the glory of God. Thank you for being our comforter. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for meeting us here in these sessions. And my prayer is that each person will continue to build their relationship with you each day. Amen.